for the woman of the hour. Dr. Nicolene Ambe is an international speaker, educator, and number one best-selling author of several books. Her primary mission is to help parents raise high achievers by creating an environment in which their children can thrive academically. Through teaching and speaking, Dr. Ambe has helped many parents develop great relationships with their children resulting in academic excellence and long-term success. More of her work can be found on her website at www.nicolineambe.com. Nicoline, are you ready to rock this? She's ready to rock it. Awesome. You are now live on Becoming Your Greatest Possible Self. Nicolene, thanks so much for coming on today to join us and have a lot of fun. Definitely. We appreciate you. You're welcome, Chris. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Let's go. Let's do it. Awesome. 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 So we're going to dive right into the theme of the day, which is patterns and paradigms. And we start off every episode, every interview by asking a question that's based on the theme of the day. So Nicolene, how, how does this this principle or these distinctions of patterns, which is when something repeats over time, you get to see a, a trend or a, a sequence, a pattern, as, as we call it, and the paradigm, which is a collective of beliefs, a collective of patterns. How have these distinctions made a difference for you in your work and your life? Pa- patterns and paradigms? Yes. Um, I think in terms of patterns, Mm -hmm. it helps us inform our perspectives. It Mm. it helps us to grow and see things differently and to learn. And so that's part of the learning curve is that Mm. you, you're open to new experiences. You're open to new shifts and you have to be open to receiving them and making a difference Mm. in your life based on what you receive. So they're, they're actually very, very important. Wow. So it it sounds like, to be able to actually grow and become our greatest possible selves, we have to one, notice the patterns, but two, actually be willing to to do something about it and shift our actions to take that information that we received from awareness and put it into implementation, into execution to create new results. Absolutely. Very Beautiful. well said. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So that's that's such a great response. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then as far as what you are working on today, I mentioned it a little bit in the intro, but why don't you share with our audience more on, on in your own words and, and just give us the, the 411 or the, the update, the what it is. <laughs> well, I am a parent empowerment speaker awesome. and I'm also a teacher mm-hmm. and I've been a teacher for the last 22 years. Mm-hmm. And taught university, I've taught law, and I've also taught elementary school students. Mm. So I've taught students from various backgrounds, skill levels, age groups, economic uh, statuses. And so I have been in that field for a very, very long time. When I completed my PhD in 1998, mm. I went straight into teaching. So I like to say that I've been in the field of education my entire life. I went yeah, to it sounds like it. <laughs> I never left. So I've been doing that for a really long time. But today we're talking about blossoming in a season of devastation. And that came about as a result of the personal tragedy of losing my husband of 16 years. So I'm hoping that today we can have a blend of both conversations, talking about how to help children become high achievers in school and also how to um, overcome very difficult situations, um, such such as the loss of a loved one, going through a bad divorce, dealing with defiant children, because that's very hurtful for a lot of parents, and just dealing with difficult life circumstances, how my experience can really um, add value to those who are going through very difficult times. So mm. we can do both, Chris. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll definitely get into to both of those. And um, thank you for sharing that. And let's start diving into that those challenging moments. You know, when you were when you're building your career, if you want to start with that, or if you want to start with with uh, your husband, you know, just take us on the journey of of what were some of the challenges and obstacles that you had to overcome to get to where we are today. Right. So um, as you can tell from my accent, I grew up in Cameroon, Mm -hmm. a small African country, Mm -hmm. and I've lived here abroad for the last, I would say, 30 years or more, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, 30 years or more. And when I completed my degree, I went into teaching. And uh, when I started teaching elementary school, I was assigned to work with students who had been designated as having a disability. Mm -hmm. Many of them I felt were normal children who needed a different support system, a different structure, a different mindset from home. Mm -hmm. I believe that parents are 
children's number one teacher. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the students who were um, in special needs classes, I felt that 80% of those students don't need to be there. If they have the right relationship with their parents, the right structure from home and and the right vocabulary and, mm -hmm. and connection with their parents. So I created a platform. Um, I always believe in being part of the solution. Totally. If you're not going to uh, uh, be part of the solution, then don't talk about the problem. Yeah. So I created a solution to go out into the communities to talk to parents about how to raise high achieving children, how to help their children at home become high achievers in school, become successful mm. and leverage that success for financial freedom later on in life. So and did you did you see that a lot of people were complaining about the problem and not offering a solution and, and that's what inspired you to get up and take action or was there something else? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people complain about parents not doing a good job, mm. but they're not sharing with parents what they need to do to do better with their children. Right. So I have been um, on several platforms. I've been on several conferences. I've been to several conferences, school districts, schools. I've been on TV, ABC, CBS, NBC. Fox. Rocking it. Rocking it. <laughs> to share this message of parental empowerment. Yeah. And I share basically seven important principles that parents can implement at home to help their children rise to academic excellence. Mm. Speaking of rise, shout out to Anze Mofor who connected us. She is an amazing, amazing woman. And uh, thank you, Anze, for connecting us. And we finally got the interview to happen. And uh, so awesome, awesome, awesome. And this is, did you want to dive into these seven um, pillars now, or did you want to share a little bit more about your journey and some of the challenges that you had to overcome to get here? Right. Let me dive into the seven and then okay. we'll go um, into the challenges. Cool. The first um, strategy, the first thing that I share with parents is to set high expectations for their children. Okay. That if you know, trust, and believe that your child is intelligent, you mm. have to raise your expectations. You cannot accept mediocre performance. So mm. if they have an F, it's okay to have an F, but you have to uh, expect that they would move that F to a D and yes. to, a C, yes. to, a, to an A. And so setting high expectations is very, very important in helping children elevate their, their mindset to reach your level of expectation for them. Mm. And, the, and then... Um, it's actually a success acronym that I use. So that's the S is to set high expectations. Okay. The U in success is to understand failure and frustration, to understand that no matter what your family circumstances, that you may be having a financial difficulties, uh, financial difficulties, or that your children may be struggling to get their grades up or do well, to understand that that's an integral part of the process, yeah. that failure isn't really failing. It's failing to get back up. But recognizing that when you fail, when you struggle to be still and mm. to overcome the challenges to get to where you want to go. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, in these first two, I, I love it because, you know, setting high expectations, it might be easy for a parent to just say, oh, you know, it'll it'll fix itself or they'll they'll figure it out or, you know, not to have that that bar raising process. And then understanding the failure and the frustration as the process happens as you raise the bar, it's going to be a continual process of not quite hitting the mark or hitting it and then raising the bar again. But eventually there's going to be some, some like not, not hitting the goal all the time. <laughs> right. And then figuring out how to, how to remedy that together. Yes. You're not going to hit it all the time, but the goal is to stay consistent and to mm. stay focused to getting mm. beautiful. And the seeing success is to create a stable home, to create mm -hmm. a learning environment at home, to, to ensure that your child has healthy, nutritious meals to feed their brain, mm -hmm. to ensure that they go to bed on time, to ensure that the home environment is quiet and it's a learning environment where children can process the information, apply the information, and to be able to think in, an, in, a, in, a, in a high order thinking manner. Mm, a lot of the, especially in California, we have a common core state test. Mm -hmm. It requires a, a deep level of uh, understanding and processing to be able to figure out the question and answer the question. Wow. So children have to have a certain kind of mindset and stability in their mind to be able to process mm -hmm. uh, that information. So creating a stable home environment is very important. Mm -hmm. And then the C in success is to conquer distractions. Mm. <laughs> that's good this, this we, could all, we could all 
we could all use some of that. <laughs> Absolutely. The seeing success is to conquer distractions. Distractions is the number one killer of dreams, even mm. in adults, even for you and I, Chris. What is that goal that you've always wanted to reach, but you just can't seem to get to it because you have a, a thousand other things to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same for me and yeah. same for our children. So distractions really um, stop children from reaching their goals because they're focused on, on, on activities that add no significant value. To them. It's a great, great point because I, I played so many years of video games growing up, like thousands and thousands, now probably tens of thousands, like honestly, mastery level, right? We can talk about Malcolm Gladwell. Um, anyway, so I played so much, so many, so many video games and after joining or like seeing personal development and the power that it has on my life, I look back and I said, Oh my gosh, I wasted so much time. And while there were some benefits from it, cognitive processing speed, strategic thinking, you know, community building online, stuff like that. Overall, it's like, Hmm, if I could have invested my time elsewhere, that probably would have made a bigger difference. And I don't regret anything. I'm grateful for what I do have. It made me who I am today. And if I were to go back and do it again, or if I had a, a child of my own, I would definitely make sure that they're being supplemented with goals, with you know setting those targets and, and developing all those different areas of you know music and art and sports and making sure they have a well-rounded, awesome life. Absolutely. Very well said. There's time for everything. Mm. And games um have their place totally too. but after your work is done yeah. after you've done what you need to do to move your life forward That's then right. you can distract yourself yes. but when you completely focus on doing things that don't really move you forward then mm. it becomes problematic and children really struggle with that these days there's so much technology this uh they're browsing their phones they're texting their friends they're calling friends and uh, i think a lot of children who fail on the test mm fail not because they don't know the information, but because mm. their, their minds are very busy with other things. Yeah. So as parents, we want to be careful about how we help our children stay focused and help them manage those distractions in their lives. Yeah. Another thing I hear is boundaries, teaching them how to set boundaries, how to set and maintain boundaries, because especially as kids, one of the things that they want to do is fit in. Right. So how do you teach a, a child how to or a young adolescent how to establish and maintain your boundaries in a in in such a demanding and peer pressured community and environment it, it's it's super interesting and fascinating how to teach them how to do that that's very good that's very good helping them develop a healthy sense of self yes this is number one mm. um, value an important uh, value that any parent can teach with their child mm. to help them see themselves as valuable and to help them focus on what's important to them and not be influenced by uh, the outside uh, circumstances. Yeah, beautiful. And then see the E in success is to coach uh, your child to uh, implement three important learning skills. Okay. The first is to listen in class, mm. paying attention, because this is how you learn the information. Um, there's no other way of learning it except listening to the teacher and being engaged in the uh, instruction. Mm -hmm. and the, the only other way of learning it is to take the teacher's manual and read it. So mm -hmm. children have to listen and pay attention in class. Parents have to talk to their children about that because there are mm -hmm. a lot of children who come to school and don't pay attention. They are passing yeah. notes. They're talking to their friends. They're checking their phones. They're on the floor. And the instruction is passing them by. So coaching children to listen in class, stay engaged, it's important to learning the information. Mm -hmm. And then if they're doing that, the second essential learning skill is to ask questions, mm -hmm. to raise their hand and ask the teacher for clarification on anything mm -hmm. they haven't understood, if they're listening and paying attention. And the third learning skill is to do their homework. Mm -hmm. After they listen to the information, they've asked for clarification, then they should be able to complete the homework on their own. And so when they come home, parents have to create a quiet environment where they can apply that knowledge they've learned during the school day and complete their homework on their own. Hmm. So that's the E in success. Awesome. And then the, the S is to study. Mm -hmm. uh, to be a good student, you have to read. You have to be a good reader. You have to be a fluent reader. And when you're a fluent reader, you can read all kinds of books. You can expand your thinking, expand your knowledge, expand your comprehension. 
it's very important that children be good readers. And for young kids from k uh, kindergarten to third grade or uh, zero to eight, mm -hmm. um, parents can read to, with their children or have mm -hmm. their children read back to them. And for older kids, create a quiet place where they can study and do their homework. Mm -hmm. So that's the S in success. Okay. Final S in success is to share a vision for the future Ooh. to help children see why, the big why. Why am I going to school every day? Why are you taking me to school every day? What is the purpose? What is the long-term vision? Mm -hmm. So parents have to help their children develop that vision for their future so that they can see their future and have a reason to work for that future today. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not sharing your vision um, but you're helping them develop a vision for their own lives and helping them see why school is important. So anybody who, people who do what they do have a reason why they do the things they do. Mm -hmm. And so children have to know why they're going to school and buy into that vision for yeah. themselves and take ownership of their work so that they can get to that place yeah. that they see. This is perfect. This is perfect. I, so much to share on this. And, you know, first off, the vision of an entrepreneur, an author, speaker, coacher, a visionary, messenger, whatever. We have a lot of those in the audience. That vision is what inspires us to get up in the morning and do our work. You know, Nicolene, you had a vision of solving these parents' problems. Without that vision, this would not have come to fruition. So that's number one. Like, it's it, it applies even to adults. Number two is... I remember like my parents did the best that they could, bless their heart, but they weren't salesmen or salespeople, right? They weren't sales driven. They didn't know about that world. I'm so grateful for the knowledge that I'm developing as a leader, as a visionary, as a communicator to teach to my kids, to be able to enroll them in a vision so that life becomes so much more easy and simple and it makes sense and they have the tools and abilities and skills to succeed like how to shake people's hands, how to do a public speech presentation, how to sell, because I didn't have those and I felt really dark and lost and like I hit rock bottom and there's a chance that I wouldn't have come back had I not had some really great you know, lessons and, and things instilled into me from my parents, but I got close. I, I was like on the edge, you know, of not, not living a life of life by design, a life of freedom and, you know, being in, in prison for the rest of my life because I was making stupid choices. And if my parents would have been better at those sales skills, who knows how my life would have turned out. So I see that there was room for growth for that. So now I'm 100% making sure that my, my child is enrolled in a vision that they choose, that they're excited about, that I know is best for them to become their greatest possible self. Absolutely. And I think we also have to help them to see, uh, maybe yeah. you can give me an idea on this help them see because they're informed by their experience and their experience is limited to what they know. Mm -hmm. So they can't really know what's ahead mm. unless you help them kind of see the picture. So the question now is, I want, where, how far can you go as a parent in influencing that vision? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> you just let them make mistakes and try and fail or do you really get into really painting that picture for them because my older daughter she's kind of resistant when i tell her about the vision where she should uh focus her her, her mind mm -hmm. she resists mm. because she wants it for herself and i say you know i've made all the mistakes i don't want you to make a mis uh, uh, costly mistakes and she's like that's part of the learning curve mom i'll make the mistakes i don't mind making the mistakes so as a parent i'm like antsy mm. but she wants to go forth right. so right. that's uh, maybe you can answer that as a as a child how did that work out for you yeah so for me i think my parents did n coddle me a lot they they wanted to make sure that i was very protected and didn't do anything dumb and i think uh, i had the advantage of playing lots of video games so they weren't too concerned about you know what what i was doing um and i think it's on the same token it's he establishing those boundaries here's what is allowed here's what isn't allowed and as far as the the child having a vision just the continued practice of of hearing and like you said the listening like so daughter you know what is your vision what's your vision this week why don't you just share it with me like i don't care what it is i'm not attached i just want to hear the passion in your voice 
like like share what you're passionate about share what you're excited about and as long as they can keep tapping into that and know that you won't back down on having them experience their passion and what they're excited about the vision that they're creating for their life then they'll they'll get to that point where they're like all right she's not gonna let me go fine let's just be happy and feel good about it and then they'll realize all along that if only i would have just made it easy and chose to do stuff that i'm happy with and and have fun then it wouldn't have been so hard so that's number one and the second thing is bring in outside influences because oftentimes a, a child won't listen to a parent because there there's a certain relationship a certain way that they listen to each other and if you bring in other speakers or heroes to the child to influence them then that will make the biggest difference in their vision altering that is true that is very true yeah well spoken thank you thank you <laughs> so we so that's so that's what i talk about chris and so this is a platform but in order to take this platform out there and actually teach it it's a whole different ball game i'm sure, right? I'm sure. <laughs> because you have to learn how to brand it mm. you have to learn how to present it and you have to learn how to market it how to mm get more speaking clients, more speaking engagements, mm -hmm. uh, more opportunities to present it. And so that in itself was a real challenge for me. So we're getting into the challenges now. Okay. And I had a lot of personal um, issues that I had to work through, self-doubt. And mm -hmm. even though I believed in my platform, even though I believed that it could help parents, I told myself so many times, Nicoline, you have a right to be here. You have worked extremely hard. You're doing something that helps people. But all these things that we grow up with, um, stereotypes and social mores and values, they really do something to strike us down when we are about to do something big. Yeah. So I experienced those challenges very early on, but I'd never give up. You keep working, you keep pushing yourself forward, you keep creating new plans, learning new things, listening from other people who have done it, and you just keep moving forward and finding the best ways uh, to, to put your platform out there. And so my, I think one of the biggest uh, self-doubt issues that I had, um, I feel embarrassed even saying it, is that I felt that my, my accent, mm. I'm like, you have an accent, you're from Africa, who are you to speak on this topic? Who are you to speak to? And I'm being very honest and authentic now. Mm. Who are you to speak to American parents about how to raise their children? Mm. But when you have a passion, Chris, it refuses to go away. And no self-doubt, no limiting beliefs will stop you. If you deeply believe in something and it's a passion and you see people struggle. I see children struggle who shouldn't be struggling. I see parents struggle who shouldn't be struggling. That passion alone will surmount and overcome those self-limiting beliefs. And I think that my passion is what has driven me to continue to find the best ways to put forth Mm. Um, and, and share this information with parents. So we the the title of this interview is "Blossom in a Season of of Devastation," right? Like real real challenges. Let's mm -hmm. let's dive into what was the devastation that was going on at that time for you? The internal devastation, the internal conflict. What what did that look like in terms of your willingness or unwillingness to show up in your work, make phone calls, connect with people, um, you know, like do the work. What did that look like that you weren't blossoming? And then how did you transform that into blossoming? Right. Yeah. Um, not making the phone calls, not knowing what to do in the first place, not mm -hmm. knowing who to call and continuing to find out ways that you need to reach more people. So I took speaking um, programs, uh, I took speaking courses. Awesome. I listened to a lot of audio. I went to conferences also to learn. Hmm. So these strategies that I used helped me overcome the devastation of self-belief. Hmm. And, and I'm not there yet. I'm not where I need to be, but I think that I've made some great inroads and impacted a lot of people along the way. So success is relative. Um, um, I think I've made an impact to a certain degree, but I want to continue to do more of that, continue to seek more opportunities to put myself out there more. Um, but when we talked about the, the blossoming, when we set up the interview, mm -hmm. I was referring to um, losing my husband of 16 years. We were married for 16 years and he passed away on December uh, 7th, 2015. Mm -hmm. And that was a horrific, uh, I mean, 
horrendous incident in my life. And it's something you would never imagine that kind of pain, uh, to be able to feel that kind of pain. But um, yeah, I went through it and uh, it was very difficult. And so I had to really think about how to move forward from it. If I was gonna allow myself to just be, be hurt, be in pain, be disappointed, be frustrated, or if I would embrace it and just move on with life and embrace life and take care of our three children. Mm -hmm. And I chose to do that. And uh, so I wanna, if you want, we can go deep into how I overcame it. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. What, what, what were you experiencing at, at the time? Just really pain, just pain, just pain and sadness is very painful. Pain is raw. Mm -hmm. Pain is real. Pain really hurts. Losing a loved one hurts. And uh, you may, for some people, it could be losing someone you love, losing through a divorce or mm -hmm. uh, just dealing with tough situations is very painful. And so when you feel that pain, it's not the time to give up or break down. Hmm. It's not the time to start, you know, being an alcoholic and just drowning yourself in the, in the pain. It's not the time to go on drugs. It's not the time to enter into bad relationships. It's not the time to pick up your phone and start calling everybody. When you're in that pain, it's time to be silent, to be quiet. Wow. You're, you're gonna feel the pain. It's gonna be painful, but you're gonna tell yourself, that I'm going to move on through this pain uh, and come out on the other side. So you have to have a great, I think, a great sense of self. Mm. You have to have a great sense of self and a great sense of purpose to understand that your life is bigger than you. Your life is bigger than your pain, that there's something bigger that you're called to do and let that thing pull you through uh, that, that process. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. What mm. was your your personal grieving process? Did you see all the memories that you guys had, and then you said you you were grateful for that and move forward, or how did you process it health in a healthy way? Right. Oh, it was so difficult for me to even look at pictures or look at those times because they brought in more pain. But what I did was I wrote words mm. every week. I would write words because what happened was the experience jolted me into reality. Right. I was like, oh, really? Is this what life is about? No. I never felt that kind of loss before. I was like, ooh, so really, this is what life is about. I had a 360 degree turnaround about what life really was. Mm. I started to write words that made life more meaningful to me. And I wrote several words. I shared some of them on Facebook. Mm. And I put all of those words in the book. I wrote words uh, relating to relationships, how to manage my relationships better, how to be more patient with my children, how to be more excellent at work, how to be a good employee, mm. how to do a good job, how to serve my students better. So I learned how to become a better person and to appreciate life more mm. through that experience. So that's how I survived it. And different people, people have different ways of surviving tragedy. Um, mm. People prefer to be in the company of loved ones and just be with them and feel that love and connection of others. And some people write, journal, I wrote. People have different ways, but I think that um, it's important during that moment to be still, to be mm. still. For me, being still and quiet and listening to that still small voice mm. will give you the power and the and the energy that you need to know what your next step should be. And I'll tell you, stillness is when the pain comes deeper and stronger because yep. yep. you feel it more, but it also brings the solution faster. Mm. Right. So uh, it, it helped me a lot to be still. I kind of um, took control of how I wanted to be in touch with people, how I wanted to reach out to people. My connections were not random. Mm. I had to make sure that I knew who I was dealing with and how to uh, invite them into that space where I was. Yeah. Wow. That's so powerful. And also I hear when you're still, it's not like you're not breathing. You're actually, you know, breathing and processing and present to the emotions, but you're also not holding on to the emotions either. You're just, you're letting them flow through. And, and because there was such a deep 
emotional connection with your husband, there was a deep reservoir of emotions and feelings and things that would bubble up to the surface from that, you know, like from your 360 degree turn of, of like what, what the world actually is like, what is life actually like? It's like, wait a second, hold on, like slow down, stop, breathe, get centered and allow these to come up in a, in a healthy controlled, I don't want to say controlled, but like healthy you know, flow of it coming out and just you're able to be with those emotions and as they come up, okay, is this still the best place, the best state to be in, you know, sitting here or in the silence, in the stillness? Should I be with someone else? Do my kids, is it important that I experience this with my kids? So you get some rationality about how to best handle and manage the emotions as they come through. Right. Very well said, Chris. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I did. And we also have to remember that, and you know, when you're in it, it's hard to think about it. Mm. But in hindsight, you have to have to remember that there's still life to be lived. Yeah. There's still children who are depending on you, who are counting on you. There's still people who are looking for you. If you're, if you're a doctor, your patients are expecting you to still continue to give them your best. Mm. If you're a parent, you have to give the best to your children. If you're a teacher, your students are counting on you to be the best teacher that they 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 would like if you're a CEO, your entire organization is looking at you. Yeah. And so you have to think about those things also and factor everything in, in, in your healing journey. Mm. But we're definitely not denying that the pain is real. But also mentally, I think it's also sometimes a mental uh, shift where you mm. say, I'm going to feel the pain. I'm going to know that this pain is here. It's real. But I'm going to allow myself to go through it because I know that I'll ultimately come out um, on the other end yeah yeah it allow accept embrace and then like we were talking about the vision the vision of what we're still here to do we still have life we still have choice we still have freedom we still have a family we still have a mission there's still things to do okay we got to get back in there absolutely chris that's it wow (laughs) so if our audience is going through some kind of devastation right now. What's the like like if something happens or let's let's talk about being prepared to handle devastation. I think that would be a better place cuz maybe not everyone's going through something right now, but to be prepared and then to process. Can we give them some tips or strategies or how they would approach devastation and and they remember back to this interview how to respond to it in a healthy way? Is there anything we can prepare them with around that? I think not everybody has a passion that they're pursuing or something that they're pursuing that's meaningful for them. But I want to encourage everyone to have something that excites them, something that wakes them up every single morning, Mm -hmm. something that they look forward to doing. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be planting a garden. It could be knitting sweaters for kids in the hospital. It could be photography. You have to do something other than your usual life, something you enjoy that adds value and meaning to you. Mm. And I think that that is for those who don't have it to try to find something like that to do, because it will give you a reason to uh, attach to something else when you're in a difficult situation. And um, also to just accept that pain is part of the journey to mm. accept that it'll come at some point. But if it comes, it's not the end of the world. You're still a whole person. You're still breathing. You're so powerful. You're still amazing. And when you overcome that pain, there's something amazing waiting to you, waiting for you on the other end. Mm. That's why I also think I keep stressing that it's important to have a passion you're pursuing because at the end of that journey, you have something that you're doing that is meaningful and that is productive that can help someone else. Um, um, through your through your talent, mm. so so those are the two ways I can I can share right now. That's beautiful. It's beautiful, and I also hear the bigger you make your talent, how it serves other people. Like say, a, a, if you're an artist, you can paint murals on city walls that inspire people. Like that's something that will get you up and going more so, probably more so than if you just paint paintings for for yourself in your own house if you have beauty and art and gifts to give the world and lots of people big communities more communities the better 
And then that will get you moving because you know that there's people who are hungry, who are in their own devastation that you could support and help them move through as well. That's true. That's true. And it, I think I've heard it saying that the more you help other people, the better you feel about yourself. Absolutely. You share your talent and other people benefit from it. Yeah. You feel great that you're making a difference for other people. Totally. So that's important point in getting over devastation is to find something meaningful that can help you blossom at the end of it. And you can build it to something into something amazing mm. that will make a difference for you and for those that you're serving. Mm. I love it. But, uh, also, if you don't have anything that is you're passionate about, just simply loving. I think love mm. is purpose. Your purpose could just be to love, to mm. love more, to mm. be kind more, to donate. If you have disposable income, donate that. It will make you feel great. Mm. Um, so reaching out more. So, so the, the most important thing, I think, for blossoming is to reach out to other people, to reach mm. out through your talent or to reach out in kindness and in love to other people. Hmm. so that you're not in your head you it's not you're not just focused on yourself and your pain hmm. and just you know thinking more about yourself but also thinking about how you can reach out and help other people yes yes so nicoline how would your life look if you were blossoming 10 times more than you are right now <laughs> i'm dreaming about it already <laughs> My life will make such a difference if I'm on mm. stages, yes. huge stages, speaking to massive audiences, mm. and I'm working my way there, Chris. This is not a this is not child's play. That's right. That's right. That's right. This ain't no hobby. This is a this is a mission. <laughs> but it is hard work. Yeah. It's hard work breaking the glass ceiling and breaking concrete walls. It's hard work, but but also that's the excitement of it. Is mm. the hope that you're going to get there. It's the hope that you're working through it and you're doing your part. You're doing what you need to do to get there, and that adds more meaning in terms of applying yourself every day, doing what you need to do every day, writing down those to-do lists and complete checking them off every day, and moving forward uh, at your pace is is I think for me, is the excitement mm. of the journey. Yes, 100%. So you're speaking on these stages and you're blossoming 10 times more. What's what's the impact? What's that like? What What's life like for you, for your kids, for your communities? Right. Life for me is living purposefully, mm. going out there and giving my best and blossoming in the glory of myself, the glory of God in me. Um, making a difference for other people and also making a financial difference for my family. I'm not ashamed to say that it's important that we make a, earn a living from our income um, because the more we can make money, the more we can help more people. So strategically finding ways of earning an income from what we do, helping people make a difference in their lives and also living our lives in an empowered way. Mm. You know, going out there and impacting the world, making a difference instead of just sitting at home, watching TV, grumbling or arguing or being down mm -hmm. and out and disappointed and complaining. Mm -hmm. No, going out there and exploring the world and sharing our vision and impacting other people. That's what life is about. That's blossoming right there. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So you, you've written multiple bestsellers. Tell us more about your books and do you have any more coming out? Tell us, tell us a little bit more about your author journey. Yes. So I've written eight books so far and wow. I'm starting to think, should I keep writing them? <laughs> um, but that also, <laughs> that also was a marketing strategy that I used. Totally. To write more books. And there are people making a killing writing several books. They've mastered the marketing game. They've mm. mastered the content game. They've mastered branding. They've mastered building an email list. And I need to work. I have a little bit of work to do on that. Mm. But I've written eight books and I have the strategy. I know how to write eight books and I know how to publish them. I wake up every single morning and I write. And people ask me, Nicolene, what is the secret? How do you write so many books? I said, there's one secret. Is to write. <laughs> <laughs> the more you write, the more you publish. 
So I, I write every single morning from five to six o'clock. My wow. goal is to write 2000 words a day. Uh, many times I fall short, but I write every single day. Some days I write a hundred words, some days it's 200, but every single day I try to write and I have a, a, a catalog of ideas. Mm -hmm. I have so many book titles that I can write about. But when my last book came out about three weeks ago, I've been thinking about maybe um, a different approach to publishing. And I've also, Chris, mastered how to publish these books. That's this is, awesome. I spoke at UCLA last week and I told the students, this is your era. This is, this is your time when if you know how to do these things on your own, you can just do them on your own without having to rely on any, anybody. Right. So I learned how to publish books on my mm. own. It's right there on Amazon. They tell you how to do it. You go on Google, you learn how to publish your book and you publish it on your own. So the opportunities are there for those who want to take them and apply them to move their lives forward. Mm. So I've mastered the writing process. I've mastered the publishing process. But now I have to think strategically about um, uh, if I want to continue doing it this way mm. or build on what I've already done, that is uh, make the books more substantive, add more information mm -hmm. and go to a traditional publisher. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. About what, that. what, what are you leaning towards and why? I'm probably leaning towards going through a traditional publisher later mm -hmm. down the road for a topic that is very impactful. Mm -hmm. And I think that it'll help uh, with the marketing and with reaching more parents. Right now, my resources mm -hmm. are limited in terms of reaching more people. But I do sell a lot of books. When I go out to speak, mm -hmm. I sell a lot of books. So that has been helpful. That has been a good way to move the books. But other than that, if, we, if I am thinking about doing it online, then mm -hmm. I probably have to find uh, some help for that. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like really the biggest difference is going to make your strategic partnerships. Maybe traditional publishing is the best route, maybe not. You know, like I think just being open to attracting that, that perfect partnership Journal about that. Get into the energy of that, that you're attracting that and creating that because it's it's coming for you. What is your marketing plan? Are you thinking about a book? Do you have one? Um, that's a great question. I have a ton of content. Um, yeah. I wrote a book with my business partner last year called How to Get the Most Out of Your Next Seminar. We never yeah. published it. Um, now my message and direction is more so the becoming your greatest possible self. So that's something I could write about. Um, I think I would do, I don't want to do a, a memoir or like a, something about me and my life journey that, that much in the mm -hmm. beginning, just because I think that there's so much depth to it that I don't want to just kind of like scrape the surface and, ah, you know, put it out as the first book. I want the first book to be like, Hey, here's what I'm credible, credible for. Here's what, here's the techniques, strategies. And here's of course a little bit about my story, but the main, you know, biography, that'll be definitely, definitely later on. So that's, a couple things that we're working on. We're doing a big, big event next year, um, and that's it's gonna have like celebrities and awesome, cool stuff there. That's gonna be epic. Where's that, Chris? Where's your event? Um, so we're thinking San Diego or Las Vegas. We're still exploring the the venue spaces, but we're thinking spring of 2019. So I'll definitely keep you posted and be putting all kinds of all kinds of marketing promotion for that. <laughs> yeah, so that'll that'll be a blast, and then continuing to do this 12 hour marathon and i had a guest on here earlier um raven the talk show maven and she's done tons of great interviews and one of the things she she said is reach out to bigger people and that's something i haven't super been intense about because i'm like i want to make the process better make the show better da 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 get bigger audience and, and it's just like all kinds of excuses for playing small and and when these big people promote me that's when all those things will happen the show will grow get more clients all kinds of good stuff like that so just continuing to make this thing better and and uh, have the content go out and have search engines pick it up and build that build that tribe absolutely and enjoying the journey yes, <laughs> yes. absolutely absolutely if you're not having fun do something different <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. it. I love it. So let's let's dive into the final takeaways from this interview for our audience. We covered a lot of different topics, a lot of different points. Um, whatever you feel like you want to you want to recall and bring back to the surface, you want to recap whatever you feel is most important for our audience to receive right now. Let's cover it. I think number one is to encourage parents to think mindfully hmm. and intentionally about supporting their children hmm. to give all you can to give your best to your children 
in the first 18 years. Mm -hmm. So that at the end of your journey, you can tell yourself, you can look in the mirror and say, I gave my best to my child. Mm. And uh, I think what I've learned from this journey is that life is really about relationships. That after all is said and done, after all the awards and the successes and the money, mm. when you're 85 years old and you're on your rocking chair, the person you want sitting next to you is your little grandchild or your great grandchild. Mm. It's not your boss. So we have to, uh, in the process of success, we can run over our relatives. We can mm. run over our relationships. We have to care and tend for those that we love who are in our close circle because that's really what life comes down to. Success is great. It'll help mm. us go far, but we also have to, in the journey, uh, think about the people that we love. So that's the one big lesson that I've learned. And also just how to understand that challenges are there for a reason. Challenges right. are there so that we can show that we have come through something mm. and we have overcome. So it's important to, to take challenges in context, to know that, that it's not a beat down. It's, it doesn't say anything about you in a negative way, mm. but to see it as, as, as part of the journey, to see it as exciting. I mean, I think challenges are exciting to me. Yes. I yes. love them because I love to get over them. I love to face them and confront them. I don't run mm. away from my challenges. I'm not intimidated by mm. challenges. I embrace them because when you embrace them and you work through them, you know you've gone on to your next level. Mm. So those are the two things I love to share, tending your relationships and embracing challenges to move on. That's so huge. I, I love that. It's like so wise, Nicolene, the, the embracing challenges for you listening right now or watching the replay. If you simply make a choice of, of I hate challenges, I hate difficulty, I hate when life is, is, is difficult, is hard, rough on me, to I embrace the challenges, I confront them, I take them head on, and I know that it's all a part of the journey. They excite me. They're fun. I, I swear that's like such a huge paradigm shift that brings people to this place, closer to this place of responsibility. I'm responsible for my life and I'm going to face the challenges and the things that try to encroach upon my happiness, my fulfillment, and the boundaries that I've set up to live an, an amazing life. I set up these boundaries and, and values that I will maintain and uphold. And if things come to try to bring them down or challenges come to to disrupt them, I'm going to face those head on. So I love, love, love that, Nicolene. And we want to know, how do we stay connected with you and what do you want our audience to do next? Right. My website is nicolineambe.com and all of my books are nicolineambe.com slash books. Cool. If the audience were to go on my website, they'll see the books and they'll also see a link to my Amazon author page and click through. Everything is available online. And also my contact page will allow you to book me for speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. I'm now booking for the fall school year and I'm always available by phone, my phone number is on my website as well. And Chris, hey, you are awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we, we had to get this this interview going. <laughs> you are a beast, Chris. You are Thank doing you. this work, 12-hour marathon. Much respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. And I so acknowledge the work that you're doing for these parents. It is much needed, appreciated, and I'm so grateful for the future generations for the work that you and everyone who's committed to the same values and mindset and you know uh, the, the flourishing of future generations, the flourishing of parents, the flourishing of their children. I am so grateful to have people like you in this world. Nicolene, thank you. Chris, and keep up the wonderful work yourself. I promise I will. We will. Let's have the best day ever, and we will see you soon, Nicolene. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Take care, okay? You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.